completed in 1653, Father Bernabe Cobos Historia del Nuevo Mundo is an important source of information on pre-conquest and colonial Spanish America. Though parts of the work are now lost, the remaining sections, which have been translated, offer valuable insights into Inca culture and Peruvian history. Inca Religion and Customs is the second translation by Roland Hamilton from Cobo's massive work. Beginning where history of the Inca Empire left off, it provides a vast amount of data on the religion and life ways of the Incas and their subject peoples. Despite his obvious Christian bias as a Jesuit priest, Cobo objectively and thoroughly describes many of the religious practices of the Incas. He catalogues their origin myths, beliefs about their afterlife, shrines and objects of worship, sacrifices, sins, festivals and the roles of priests, sorcerers and doctors. The section on Inca customs is equally inclusive. Kobo covers such topics as language, food and shelter, marriage and childbearing, agriculture, warfare, medicine, practical crafts, games and burial rituals. Because the Incas apparently had no written language, such post-conquest documents are an important source of information about Inca life and culture. Kobo's work, written by one who wanted to preserve something of the indigenous culture that his fellow Spaniards were fast destroying, is one of the most accurate and highly respected. In this video, I will present what Kobo wrote about Tiwanaku. I believe it is the most detailed description of Tiwanaku of any of the early Spanish chronicles. Before I start reading from his book, I would like to present a little more information on who Bernabe Kobo was. I will do so by reading an outtake from the book God in the Enlightenment from 2016, page 85 to 86, chapter 3. Bernabe Cobo's Recreation of Authentic America in Colonial Peru, written by Claudia Bruceder. Quote, Cobo was an intellectual who saw American nature and culture with the eyes of a Renaissance humanist. Much like a European textual critic from the 15th century who resurrected a Greek original, wiping away errors in transcription and interpretation. Bernabe Cobo, who lived from 1580 to 1657, considered American nature and culture to be a book that required reconstruction in his Historia de Nuevo Mundo, completed between 1646 and 1653. In so doing, Cobo surpassed as a scholar many of his Peruvian contemporaries. He indirectly freed resurrected indigenous knowledge and culture from antiquated European paradigms, thereby sparing them, as he saw fit, from uncivilized Spanish behavior and eradication. Cobo used what he took to be the most appropriate heuristic tools of his own time, ignoring classical and biblical frameworks. His move radically challenge paradigms of how to judge indigenous knowledge and religion. He laid the grounds for a new cultural history on the shores of the Pacific." End quote. Now I will read from the book Inca Religions and Customs with the original title Historia del Nuevo Mundo by Father Bernabe Cobo, translated and edited by Roland Hamilton. Chapter 19 of the Temple and Buildings of Tiguanaco Although the temple of Tiguanacu was a universal guaca and shrine, nevertheless, it was not venerated as the three shrines mentioned above. The people held it in high esteem, principally because of the size and antiquity of its buildings, which were the most magnificent and attractive of the whole kingdom. This shrine is located on a high plain within the second level of the tierra, the plain extends for many leagues, however, it is only about one and a half leagues wide, because 
surrounded by two small ranges of mountains. The town of Tiguanacu is located in this savanna or plain next to a small river that they empties into Titicaca, four leagues from the town. The royal highway goes from Cusco to La Paz, it passes through Tiguanacu at a point just nine leagues from La Paz. The natives are of the Passage nation because it falls within the provenance of this name. The ancient ruins of these superb buildings are 200 paces south of the town. And it appears that the town, before it came under Inca rule, was Taipicala from the Aymara language, which is the native language of the region. The name of this town means the stone in the middle, because the Indians of the Kalao were of the opinion that this town was in the middle of the earth and that the people who repopulated the world after the flood came out of this place. Now I will explain why it was called Diaguanaku. Its inhabitants say that once, while the Inca was here, a messenger arrived from Cusco in a surprisingly short time. The Inca was informed as to the speed with which the message had been brought. When the messenger came forth, the Inca said to him, Yay, Guanacu, which means in their language, sit down and rest, Guanacu, which is very swift animal of this land. Because of the speed with which it had arrived, and this name was applied to the town from that time on, except we changed some of the letters when we pronounced this name. Now I will explain what I have been able to determine on the basis of the traces and ruins that still remained of these edifices on the occasions when I saw them and pondered over them. The size, form and shape of these edifices is as follows. The main part of the stonework is called Puma Punku, which means Gate of the Lions. It is a mound or flat-topped hillock, two estados high, made by hand. It was erected on large, well-worked stones, which are in the form of the ones we put over the graves. This mound is made square, with four sections of equal size, and each one hundred paces from corner to corner. At the top are two platforms. There is space six feet wide, like a large step, and the second one has a smaller such space than the first one. The face or front of this building is a section that faces east toward other extensive ruins that I will tell about presently. From this front section the structure emerges with the same height and wall of stone. 24 feet wide and 60 feet long. Two angles are formed at the sides and this place that juts from the square mound seem to have some sort of large room or hall placed in the middle of the front of the structure. Somewhat more inside the part that juts out. The entire ground is paved with large magnificent stones. Therefore, this must have been the temple or the main part of it. This paved area is 154 feet long and 46 feet wide. The stone slabs are all surprisingly large. I measured them and the biggest one is 32 feet long, 16 feet wide and 6 feet thick. The others are somewhat smaller some 30 feet long, others smaller, but all of them are unusually large. They are smooth and flat like a well-polished board, and they have many decorations and moldings on the sides. At the present time, there are no walls still standing on this paved area. 
but judging from the many carefully worked stones that have fallen around it, among which pieces of doors and windows can be seen, the place must have been enclosed by well-made walls. The only thing that is still standing on the main stone slab is one part facing east that is dug out of a large well-worked stone which is 9 feet high and is the same width and the door space is 6 feet high and its width is in proportion. Near this doorway there is also an intact window which faces south made entirely of a single well-worked stone. Along the front of this building the foundations of a dressed stone wall are found. It comes out from the corners of this front section and occupies another square space like the one for the mound and foundations of the whole edifice. Within this wall, about 30 feet from the edge of this building, towards the south corner, the foundations stand about 3 feet from the ground level, and they are made of well-polished ashlar stones. These rooms look like pools or baths, or the foundations of some sort of tower or bu burial place. An aqueduct or marvelous worked stone channels goes across the middle of the ground level outside. It is a canal a little more than two spans wide and about the same height, made of square dressed stones which do not need mortar. The top stone fits into the walls of the above mentioned canal. The grooves in the top stone overlap one finger width and it fits into the space across the canal walls. About 400 paces to the east of this edifice, the ruins of another one just as big and magnificent are seen. It is impossible to determine whether this second edifice was separate from the first or if they formed a single complex. The construction may have continued someplace but there are no traces of it left today. In any case, the Indians use a different name for the second edifice. It is called Acapana. This mound, about four or five estados in height, which appeared to be a hill. It was erected upon a large stone foundation. In form, it is square, and at intervals it has what resembles the circular towers of a fortress. Fifty paces to the east of the mound, a large gateway remains intact. It consists of only three well-worked stones, one on each side and another on the top of them both. No other parts of this structure remain here on the ground except the mound and some worked stones that jut out from the foundation. On the basis of this, form of the construction can be seen. Close to this mound is another one which is also square. A street 50 feet wide se separate the two mounds. Thus, both of them seem to be part of a single structure. The walls of the last building has fallen down to the ground now. Its workmanship and form can be determined on the basis of one part of the wall that is still intact. This is because the diligence and care of a priest who served in Tiwanaku. His name was Pedro del Castillo, a conscious man who made a careful study of the size and quantity of the buildings. During the many years that he was a priest in the above mentioned town, he died in the year 1620. This wall is made of stone blocks without mortars and the stones are well fitted together as carefully finished pieces of wood. The stones are of medium size and other very large stones are placed at intervals like buttresses. This is similar to our buildings of adobe walls in which brick buttresses which extend from the top to bottom are usually inserted. Thus this wall has at intervals in place of buttresses some stones like square columns that are so extraordinarily large that each extends from the foundations up to the very top of the wall, 
which is three or four estados high, and it is not known how far these stones penetrate into the earth, where they are placed. Judging by the visible traces of this wall that remain, evidently it was a large enclosure that extended to the east from this last building and covered a very large area. Here the remains of another stone canal like the first one are found, and this one seems to come from the mountain range that is in front of the building, at a distance of one league. I find two things about these constructions that should not be passed over lightly without giving some thought to them. The first is the amazing size of the stones and of the whole complex, and the second is the extraordinary antiquity of the site. Who would not be astonished to see unusually large stones that I have described? Who would not wonder how human strength would suffice to carve such huge stones out from the quarries and carry them to where we see them now? This is all the more amazing since it's known fact that no stones or quarries are found within several leagues of this site. Moreover, no, none of the people of this new world have ever made use of the invention of machines, wheels or winches for the purpose of pulling the stones, nor did they have any animals that could pull them. I must confess that I cannot fathom nor understand with what strength it would have been possible to bring the stones nor what instruments or tools would have been adequate for such a job in a place where iron was unknown. And we have to confess that in order for the stones to have been worked into the form and size in which we see them now, they must have been much bigger before they were shaped to perfection. All of these stones are of two or three different kinds. Some are red sandstones, literary grindstones, and are, uh, and are soft to work. Others are brown or ash colored and very hard. The workmanship used is varied and very different from ours. The skillfulness of the work is most clearly shown by the fact that the stones are as smooth and flat as they could possibly be. Since the Indians did not have any form of writing, there are many things about them that cannot be determined. Thus, in the majority of the cases we proceed with uncertainty and by conjectures, and this is what happens when we try to investigate. The beginnings of this ancient place, to determine what men made these buildings, how long the buildings have been here. Nevertheless, the fact of the matter is that the Indians do not remember any of these, these things. They all confess that is, that it is such an ancient construction that their information does not go back that far. However, they do agree on one thing. The buildings were already constructed many years before the Incas started to govern. In fact, it is widely reported among the Indians themselves that the Incas made their great edifices in Cusco as well as other parts of the kingdom on the models of this place. Some fables introduced among the Indians originated because of the antiquity of the site. Some state that they heard from their ancestors that this construction had appeared in one night. Others state that the large stones that we see here were brought through the air at the sound of a trumpet played by a man. In addition, there are several opinions that I have heard from men of good judgment and among them there is no lack of those who feel that this is the work made before the flood and that it must have been some great city built by giants. I do not dare to appear resolutely in a matter so doubtful, but if conjectures are worth it, I take out those that I found here and they are not so light that they do not have too much weight, which is a work of remarkable antiquity and it is the first the one that the stones of the building show, that 
of having existed long times, because the rains have been enough to wear them down and consume them in great part. Because wherever the trace of the above-mentioned wall goes, those, lar those large stones that served as raffles were driven into the ground, and with having been all of the greatness that I have said and carved from four corners, some of them are so diminished and worn that they are not more than one state high, and others less. And that which remains out of the ground is almost without a trace of having been carved, because they seem rough and pointed. And it is clearly seen that the rains have disfigured them and consumed them, because in the upper part they are much more worn, and towards the foundation the work and shape they had is discovered. And it cannot be less but that many centuries have passed through them, that otherwise the water would not have been able to make such an impression on them. The second argument that I found from its antiquity makes me more convinced, and it is the multitude of carved stones that are under the first. Because it is so, that ultra of those that lie on the surface, so of those that have fallen from the buildings, as well as other very large stones that are separated from them. It is admirable to see those that are taken from under the ground and the way they are found. Because the ground of all that field, being as it is, flat and covered with grass, without any sign of ravines or landslides, wherever they dig the earth by half a meter around the aforementioned ruins, one and two states deep down, the ground is full of these carved stones, and among them very large and beautiful slabs, which seem to be buried, buried here in some great city. After I spent the first time in these buildings in 1610, they unearthed a carved stone so large that, showing it to me again, walking through here, I measured it myself, and it was 20 feet long and fifteen wide, as polished and smooth as the most, and trying to conferring this point with the priest of Tiguanacu, of whom I mentioned above, I certify that by digging in the, digging in the patio of his house to make a pond for decoration and austeration to receive the first bishop who came to Tiguanacu, shortly after they went deep, they found some of these carved stones, and Mori told me that being in charge of the factory of the church of that town, which was being built, he instructed the architect to make two stone lumps of St. Peter and St. Paul, which today are placed in the main door of the church. And as the master wanted to excuse himself with not having the stones to carve them, the mentioned priest told him that that was not an excuse there being many carved stones of all sizes wherever they dug, and that for proof he should then dig into that very place where they perhaps were when they were talking about this. Which was done like this, and before delving much, they found stones of greatness, of which the holy figures were made. It is also a rare thing to have been found in these buildings so large stone idols, whose stature is known to be giants. The main cause of the Indians having the veneration that they had for this shrine must have been its great antiquity. The natives adored it from time immemorial, before they were conquered by the kings of Cusco, and the mentioned kings did the same after they were lords of this province who had for a long time known the famous aforementioned Pumapunku building. And they illustrated and enriched it, increasing its decoration and the number of ministers and sacrifices. And next to it, they built royal palaces, in which they say Manku Kapak, son of Kwaina Kapak, was born, whose ruins are seen today and it was a very large building with many rooms and apartments. 
Due to the fame that runs in this kingdom of having great wealth buried in the buildings, some Spaniards have moved to dig in them, looking for it, and at different times they have found many pieces of gold and silver, although not as much as it is presumed to be. And in truth, this greed of having the treasures that public fame says is hidden here has been the one who has most disrupted and ruined this factory. Although they have also undone it to take advantage of the stones, because from them the church of Tiguanaco has been built, and the residents of the city of Chuquiabo have brought many to carve their houses, and even the Indians of the mentioned Tiguanaco people make their graves of very beautiful slabs that remove these ruins. And I have no doubt that if they were near any of the main cities of this kingdom, they would have been very useful and would not have left a single stone on the earth. But because they are as they are in a wilderness far from the Spanish populations, there are still so many that they will not finish them for many years. It did not seem right to me to pass in silence a very remarkable thing that happened in these buildings. It was like this. The first trustee of the town of Tiguanaco was a neighbor of Chukiobo called Captain Juan Vargas, who, having been sent to Spain in the time of the civil wars of this land, found himself very distressed at court because his business was not on the way to having a good an office as he wanted. Being one day in the palace courtyard, an unknown man came to him and told him, Why was he sad, being the lord of the richest people in the world, which was Tiwanaku? And he gave him a memory of the dispositions of these buildings, and in which part of them and how he would find the wealth that he declared. When the mentioned captain returned to this kingdom after the business had concluded because he had gone to Spain, he had the said building dug in accordance with the relationship that the man or demon in human figure had given him, which such was thought to have been, and the signs and signals that he discovered, he was finding the memory that brought very punctual and true in everything. At the beginning he took out many jars full of very fine combi clothes, llanas and silver pitchers, lots of beads and vermilion, unearthed a skeleton or frame of a human body of the greatness of a giant, and continuing in his discovery very happy. Because he was encountering all the signs that he brought by memory, one day he found a very large human head made of gold whose face was very similar to the above-mentioned stone idols. Greedy with this to find greater wealth, he had no room for pleasure. But it lasted short, because the following night death cut short his steps, which came upon him, having gone to bed well and without any ailment. A case that greatly frightened and removed the greed from those who had it to continue digging in demand for the treasures that are, that are presumed to be buried in the mentioned buildings. End of chapter.